Wake up! This is the fundamental message of the Buddha Dharma. Wake up! This person that we practice with, this image on the Buddhadan, that we all recognize from our gardens and gift shops, the Buddha. The word Buddha means the one who is awake. The person, the one who has woken up. Dogen Zenji, who was a 13th century Zen master, said to study Zen is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be awakened through the 10,000 things. When we come to practice together, when we come to engage in this practice together, to engage in this form together, we find that there are all kinds of rules, all kinds of form that we apply ourselves to, that we try to be mindful of, aware of. The form that we use encompasses every aspect of our movement, of our sitting, of our chanting. In a formal environment, in a practice center, it encompasses every aspect of the whole day. And our practice is simply to wake up, to be there when it's happening. Even in just one period, even in just the 20, 25 minutes that we've all been sitting here, I think that we can reflect that we aren't always entirely present. When I shout, it's a forceful old technique that forces us, brings us back. We say, whoa, what's going on? And we have to land. We have to arrive here wholeheartedly in the midst of our unfolding life. But it doesn't last. We don't stay. As soon as we gather that everything's safe, as soon as we gather that nothing is threatening us, right away we go back to our thoughts and our fantasies. We begin thinking about what just happened. We begin uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen next. But the whole time, we're missing this wondrous activity that's unfolding in front of us through our whole lives. The first part of Dogen's formula is to study Zen, is to study the self. This form of practice that we engage in, it's called Zazen, sitting Zen, is simply a way of developing this tool, this capacity to be aware, to investigate this thing that we call me, I, a self, who am I? What am I? What is it that is watching? What is it that is questioning? Each of us goes about our lives making decisions about what it is that we want, what it is that we want to do, what it is that we want to avoid, all based on this idea of there being this thing that we call a self. We assume it. We completely accept its existence and base every decision, every action, everything on its existence. Our starting point in Zen practice is to simply investigate this thing that we call a self. Where is it? One of the fundamental uh, cornerstones of the Buddhist doctrine is anatta, it's called, or anatman in Sanskrit. It means no self. 
It is the position of the Buddha Dharma that in spite of our belief in it, in spite of our basing everything that we do on it, this thing that we call a self cannot be found. When we look at the course of our lives and we say, is it our thoughts that make a self? We can reflect that two weeks ago, the thoughts that I had are very different than the thoughts that I have today. When I was a child, the thoughts that I had are also very different than the thoughts that I have today. And I think it's safe to assume that next week or in 15 years, the thoughts that I will have will be very different than the thoughts that I'm having today. So we cannot find the self in our thoughts. Our feelings are much the same. How I feel changes from moment to moment to moment. We cannot find a self in our feelings. Even our beliefs, the things that we hold dear, change from the time that we're children to the time that we're old people. None of this stays the same. Uh, even this physical body, we're told every seven years, there is not a single cell that has not died and been replaced with a new cell. So even in this skin bag, this physical body, there is nothing that we can point to to say, no, that's me. This realization or this investigation has profound impact. Without this existence of a self which stands separate from things, without the existence of a self which we can identify and hold on to, we are forced to reconsider our whole position. We're forced to reconsider all of our decisions. We're forced to reconsider our perception and conception of this world that we live in. If we are not a self that stands independent, separate, and alone from all things, then what are we? A second cornerstone of the Buddha Dharma is the teaching of Pratitya Samutpada, interdependent co-origination. The Buddha taught that all things in this cosmos arise together. We arise from one unified source and we are intimately connected with all other things in this vast cosmos. Each thing is made up entirely of other things. If we were to look at a flower, we can see that it's made up of sun. It's made up of water. It's made up of earth. It's made up of air. But if we take these elements, which are not flower, away, there is no flower. There's no flowerness there. Each and everything in this cosmos, whether it's a mountain or a tree or an ocean or a person or a car, is of this very same nature. When we come to practice, we are asked to sit still. We're asked to engage and apply ourselves to this form. The question is why? What's the point of this? 
To look at Buddhist philosophy is a very uh, fun and interesting thing to do. You can think about it all day long. You can even have great insights based on investigating and thinking about Buddhist philosophy, or just about any philosophy for that matter. But the Zen school is interested in experience. The Zen school is interested interested in realization. The Zen school is interested in awakening in this moment. As we sit, as we stabilize our bodies and our breath and our mind, what happens? As we face the discomfort of our bodies, as we face the challenge of harmonizing with the activity that's happening around us in walking or in chanting, what happens? These thoughts, these feelings, these preferences and aversions that we hold onto as being ourselves rise to the surface abruptly sometimes, forcefully sometimes. We feel resistances, we feel discomforts, we feel aversions, we feel uh, indulgences. In each of the activities that we do, this thing that we call a self jumps up and says, I want to do this, I don't want to do that. And yet we sit still, we sit stable. We don't have to do anything about it. We don't have to try to force it down. And we don't act out on it, running away at the first opportunity or shouting, you guys are all crazy, I'm out of here. The only task that we have is to just remain stable, remain solid, remain awake, so that when we have these arisings of preferences and aversions, we see them clearly. Over the past few weeks, I've I've been talking about practice as a mirror. And this is how it works. This environment is one that is stable. There are clear guidelines. Uh, Just before we sat, Yushin was was getting people to move back on their cushions so that the front line of the row is clear. The Jikijitsu, gosh, the nicest Jikijitsu in the world, uh, is asking us, please try to sit still. Please try to breathe quietly. Please. Uh, this is a, a word I don't hear Jikijitsu say very often. Hmm? Uh, all of this provides us with a container with a structure, with a mirror that allows us to see ourselves, this thing that we call a self, our choices, our preferences. As we go through life, we bind ourselves to this idea of me. We bind our experience to the preferences and aversions that we pick up Based on those preferences and aversions, we pursue the things that we think will make us happy, and we try to avoid the things that we think will make us unhappy. We say things like, I couldn't do that, that's just not me. Or we say, oh yeah, that's all right, because that's totally me. But in practice, what we can see is that these preferences these choices, and these habits. They are things that we pick up. We choose ourselves. We take them up and bind ourselves to them, and in doing so, limit our fundamental capacity. We're not bound to preferences. We're not bound to aversions. And what we can find in this simple activity of chanting, in the simple activity of walking, in the simple activity of sitting, 
is that how we experience our lives, whether it is a, a positive experience or whether it is an experience that brings us suffering, has a great deal to do with how we hold the self. I don't like chanting. If you fixate, I don't like chanting, then anytime you find yourself in an environment with chanting, you are unhappy. But in the period of chanting, if for even a moment you let go of your fixation with being the person who doesn't like chanting, you find that you're swept up in something that is much bigger than you. The self disappears. Like and dislike disappear and you become complete in the activity of chanting. After a couple of moments, our preferences arise again. That was weird. I still don't like chanting. Over and over again, as we practice, we can experience, we can experience that these preferences are a choice that we pick up. And we can experience the relief and the liberation when we let go of the position of self and dissolve into the activity that we're engaged in. We do this in a very structured, uh, formal way in Zen practice. But the structure and form of Zen practice is not what's important in our lives, in a life of awakening. It is this practice of investigating the self, learning how to let go, to forget self. So that as we go out into our lives, into uh, family reunions and holiday celebrations and work environments and school classrooms, and we find ourselves in suffering, in difficulty, fixated on what we want and what we think should be and how things ought to be, we actually have an experiential basis for dropping it, letting it go, dissolving into the activity that we're engaged in, dissolving into the relationship that we're engaged in. And what happens when we do that? Dogen says, To study Zen is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be awakened through the 10,000 things. 10,000 things is just a way of saying everything. When we stop holding ourselves apart from the relationship that we're in, when we stop holding ourselves apart from the environment that we find ourselves in, when we stop holding ourselves apart from the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we find that we suffer less. We find that we are more engaged with. We find that at once, subject and object unify. We find that our perspective of this world stops being about independent I am things bumping up against one another in a vast ocean of space. And we find, we feel, we experience for ourselves that all things in this vast cosmos are one. We are not separate from the people that we are making relationship with. We are one. We are not separate from the environment that we find ourselves in. We are one. In all of this world, there is nowhere else to go. There is nothing else to do than what we're doing in this very moment. This moment is the complete content of your life. 
There's nowhere else to be. Wake up. <laughs>